Today's podcast is brought to you by Hypervape. Hypervape.com. Sleek, discreet, and reliable. That's H Y P R V A P E. Hypervape.com. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode will explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Episode 17. In the previous episode, we learned about Big Nose Kate Haroni and the tumultuous love affair between her and Doc Holliday. Kate may have been one of the few eyewitnesses to the famous gunfight at the O.K. Corral, and her ties to the Earp family were also close. In fact, it's likely she knew Wyatt Earp before Doc Holliday did. And Wyatt was no stranger to the ladies either. While the man had many women in his life, there are three women who had the biggest impact on his life. But only one would remain by his side to the end. So just who were these ladies? And why were the women Wyatt loved so important to the story of the O.K. Corral? In this episode of the Drift and Ramble podcast, it's all about the actress Josephine Marcus, Mrs. Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp's first love began with a courtship with a local girl in 1869. He married Orilla Sutherland on January 10, 1870. The young bride and groom purchased land to build a home and began their life as any typical frontier couple of the times. But Arilla, who was pregnant with their first child, died suddenly in September or October of 1870. It was possibly from typhoid fever. Things then began to spiral out of control for Wyatt. In November, Wyatt was elected town constable of Lamar, Missouri, but he had some accounting difficulties and failed to turn over fees he had collected on behalf of the town's school. In 1871, a lawsuit was filed against Earp for his alleged oversight, and things continued to go downhill. Soon, Wyatt found himself facing charges of horse theft in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and he was jailed. Unable to make the $500 bail, Earp climbed out through the ceiling one night, and he escaped, winding up in Fort Scott, Kansas. About this time, a young runaway named Martha Jane Maddie Blaylock was working at a brothel in Fort Scott where she met Wyatt Earp. Wyatt was still on the run, and he and Maddie took the train to Peoria. There, they met up with Wyatt's younger brother, Morgan. Wyatt, Maddie, and Morgan all found work in the brothel business. Maddie claimed she was Wyatt's wife and continued to live with him for ten years, much of it while working in a brothel run by his sister-in-law, Bessie. Bessie was married to James Earp, Wyatt's older brother. Maddie developed a fondness for laudanum, a highly addictive opiate, and Wyatt eventually grew tired of Maddie's inability to care for herself. Maddie Blaylock was not the first woman of ill repute to claim she was married to Wyatt Earp, but she certainly made the claim longer than anyone else. Though no record exists of an official marriage, common law marriages were widely accepted, and when the couple moved to Tombstone, Maddie stopped turning tricks. But things would change when a young actress came to town by the name of Sadie Marcus. Wyatt was smitten with her. The vivacious, flirtatious little vixen captured Wyatt's attention from the moment he first saw her. The trouble was, she was living with the county sheriff, Johnny Behan, at the time, 
and Behan was nearly twenty years her senior. But these were merely details, as Wyatt Earp and Sadie began to fall in love. So just who was this sexy Sadie Marcus, and how did she become the final Mrs. Earp? Josephine Sarah Marcus, also known as Sadie, was born in New York to a Prussian Jewish family, but the family moved to San Francisco when Josephine was very young. Here, she attended dance school, which she loved, but her father, a baker, had difficulty finding work, and the family moved in with her older sister and brother-in-law in a cramped working-class tenement. As Sadie grew, her physical beauty developed and a bold personality emerged. Infatuated with the stage, Sadie wanted to be a performer more than anything. Barely a teenager, she ran away. Though she purposely obscured the details of her life between 1874 and 1880, Josephine could have surfaced in Arizona as early as 1874. Using the alias of Sadie Mansfield and working as a prostitute from 1874 to 1876, Sadie Mansfield eventually became ill and returned to San Francisco, where Josephine Marcus had family. If Josephine Sadie Marcus was in fact Sadie Mansfield, then that would put her at the center of a controversy beginning with the end of Johnny Behan's marriage. Or maybe Sadie met Behan working as a dancer in a traveling dance troupe. It simply isn't clear. What is clear is that Behan's wife grew tired of Johnny's drunkenness and abuses. When word got around to his wife that Behan was involved with a 14-year-old prostitute named Sadie Mansfield, the jilted wife of the county sheriff filed for divorce. Strangely, she left her son in Behan's care so she could remarry. Now a free man and a single dad, Behan went to San Francisco to ask for Sadie's hand in marriage. Sadie Marcus and Johnny Behan returned to Arizona to live together, though not officially as husband and wife. Marcus and Behan were now together, but Behan's womanizing continued in full bloom, and young Josephine was quickly disillusioned. Still, Behan kept promising that one day he would make her his bride. Josephine's constantly evolving narrative about her early days in Arizona make it impossible to trace her trail. Her efforts to sanitize the story were, in part, a way of protecting her own family from her past. And maybe there was much she wasn't proud of. After all, aren't we, as authors of our own biographies, guilty of the same crime? But is it possible that Josephine had an affair with Wyatt Earp? Could that have been the catalyst for the gunfight at the O.K. Corral? Some historians think so. Early on in her book, Anne Kirshner, author of Lady at the O.K. Corral, The True Story of Josephine Marcus Earp, posits that Sadie Marcus may have indeed been the reason for the gunfight, stating that, The gunfight at the O.K. Corral was a love story, fought over Josephine Marcus, a woman of beauty and spunk, barely out of her teens, escaping the restrictions of birth, and seeking adventure, independence, and romance. But how could this be? The question is never fully answered in Kirshner's work. Even author Stuart Lake had a similar theory. He once wrote that Johnny Behan's girl may be the key to the whole yarn of Tombstone. But he wrote that in a private letter, and not in his book titled Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshal. Short of finding the Old West equivalent of a contract killing, like a document from Johnny Behan ordering the deaths of the Earp brothers because of Sadie Marcus, it's unlikely we'll ever know the role Josephine actually played beyond love interest to the key players. Josephine was young, attractive, vibrant, and wild. Her desire for adventure was insatiable. Rumors abound about a scandalous photograph in which young Josephine is pictured naked at about age 19 
barely obscured by a thin, sheer, see-through silk covering. The photograph has been widely circulated as being Josephine. But where did it come from? And how did it survive? The ability to copy a photo like this would not be available for many years from the time in which it was alleged to have been made. And as attractive as the young girl in the picture may be, many believe that it looks nothing like Josephine. Others state that based on modern science and forensic technologies, the photo appears to be authentic and matches up with bone structure and other forensic markers from authenticated photographs of Josie. When author Glenn Boyer used that photo on the cover of his book, I Married Wyatt Earp, the controversy only grew deeper. What we do know is that Johnny Behan was the sheriff of Yavapai County, Arizona. Crime under his jurisdiction was rampant, and Behan had close ties to its perpetrators. When Cochise County was established, Behan used his political influence to become the first sheriff of the county, while Wyatt Earp ran against him. Earp was defeated under suspicious circumstances, and Johnny Behan became the newly formed county's first sheriff. With all the political and criminal elements of this story, it's difficult to imagine finding room for love as the central motivating factor for the gunfight at the O.K. Corral. Virgil Earp was Tombstone's marshal. Behan and the older Earp worked so poorly together that there is documented correspondence complaining about the two and the rampant lawlessness in and around Tombstone at the time. Governor John Gosper was so appalled by how the two men blamed each other for their ineffectual law enforcement that the governor sought help from the U.S. government. Certainly, Behan's ties to the Clantons and the McLowrys were close, and the crime wave around Tombstone continued unabated. But after a couple of stagecoaches were robbed and innocent men were killed, the Earps sought to make Behan take action against his friends. Whether Behan resented the Earps in moving in on his territory, his friends, or more specifically that Wyatt was moving in on his girl, we may never really know. But clearly, Behan and Josephine were embroiled in their own personal conflict. Was Wyatt Earp the reason? It's easy to assume so. And besides, isn't there usually a woman at the center of every great battle? Speculation is all we can have about the root cause of tensions between Wyatt Earp and Johnny Behan. Circumstantial evidence puts Josephine in the eye of the storm. Maybe that's enough to draw your own conclusions. Josephine caught Behan in bed with another woman in the summer of 1881, and by fall, a series of events would culminate in that historical gunfight of October 26, 1881. Wyatt was cautious not to be seen with Josephine prior to the gunfight at the O.K. Corral. But afterwards, there was nothing secretive about their affair. When Wyatt left town to go on his vendetta ride, Josephine went back to San Francisco. Sometime in 1882, the two were reunited, and Josephine, from that point forward, was forever known as Mrs. Wyatt Earp, though no official marriage documents have ever been discovered. Though Maddie Blaylock considered herself to be Wyatt's wife, Wyatt did not share her view. He had become so accustomed to Maddie's incapacitated state that he simply let her drift out of his life. After all their years together, Wyatt moved on with Josephine, without so much as a word or goodbye to Blaylock. Maddie finally realized that Wyatt wasn't coming back for her, so she went to spend time with her old friend, Big Nose Kate, before eventually moving in with a gambler. She asked Wyatt for a divorce, but he refused because he did not believe the two were married. Eventually, drugs proved to be Maddie's true love, and she died from an overdose of laudanum. Her death was ruled a suicide.
Meanwhile, Josephine and Wyatt Earp lived a full life together. They tried their hands at saloons, sporting events, mining ventures, and real estate investments. They attended the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, and they also attended Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, located nearby. They traveled the country, seeking their fortunes, even spending time in Nome, Alaska. While in Alaska, Wyatt operated a saloon called the Dexter, which proved to be a successful venture. The Earps sold their interest in the saloon for $80,000. That's about $2 million in today's money. They made money quickly and lost it frequently. Both of them loved to gamble. And while they enjoyed the notoriety of being Mr. and Mrs. Wyatt Earp, they tired of the lies and myths that often accompanied the name. Eventually, the couple settled in Los Angeles, California, where Josephine and Wyatt befriended many of the rising stars of Hollywood at that time. Earp sought to have his memoirs written, and he used his Hollywood connections to meet a man named John Flood, the first to attempt to write the biography of Wyatt Earp. But the man proved to be an ineffectual writer. There was a great deal of friction over certain elements of the story, too. Josephine was highly protective of her past, and there were many disagreements over what should be removed from the story. Soon, the author was spending as much time documenting Josephine's snappy outbursts as the story itself. Josephine's continuous attempts to cleanse the record, combined with the writer's wooden prose, made the resulting book so unattractive to publishers that no one wanted to buy the rights. Still, the Earps pressed on. When Wyatt was in his 80s, he met Stuart Lake, and while Lake simply wanted to write a magazine article, Earp convinced him to become his biographer. Josephine, again, worked tirelessly to sanitize the story of Wyatt Earp. The resulting book, Wyatt Earp, Frontier Marshal, became a bestseller when it was released in 1931, two years after Wyatt Earp had died. Josephine first chastised Lake's work as a book of lies. Lake fired back that Josephine attempted to influence his writing, and she did. If you listen to episode 15, you'll hear to what extent she had success. Once the royalty checks began to come in, Josephine grew more accepting of the work. The end result was that the name of Wyatt Earp had been completely transformed in the minds of the American public. Though controversy would continue to surround the story of the Earps, Josephine embarked on writing her own biography. With assistance from Wyatt Earp's cousins, Mabel Earp Kaysen and Viola Earp Ackerman, the three women set about to tell Josephine's story. But as they began contacting publishers, they found no takers. Josephine's inability to share the truth about her time in Tombstone was a deterrent to potential publishers, so much so that she was never able to get the book to print. Josephine then asked that all copies of the manuscript be burned, but Mabel secretly kept her copy. Years later, author Glenn Boyer would claim to acquire the rights to that work, and he eventually produced a book titled I Married Wyatt Earp. But the book became mired in controversy as the author's claims became impossible to prove. Boyer's work was eventually discredited and is now considered a work of fiction, just as Stuart Lake's book is. Josephine loved to gamble, and her habits often got the best of her. Wyatt often worried that Josephine would not survive financially without him. Although the couple were known to have their ups and downs, Wyatt's actions proved his love for Josephine, and she proved her love to him. Despite her own checkered past, Josephine was deeply loyal to those she loved, and one such man was Johnny Behan's son from his first marriage, 
Albert Price Behan, with whom she had always been very close. Josephine died on December 20, 1944, in Los Angeles, California, at the age of 83. She is buried next to Wyatt Earp in Colma, California, in the Marcus family plot at the Hills of Eternity Memorial Park. Both Kate Heroni and Josephine Marcus proved to be strong-willed, stout-hearted, brave women of the West. These were not just soiled doves standing in the shadows of their men, but strong, intelligent women with their own set of rules, justice, and passions. Despite the legendary men they loved, they've earned their own place in the wild history of the Old West. A great many resources were used in compiling this episode. Though every effort has been made to provide an accurate account, some discrepancies may arise. I'd like to acknowledge the following resources. Lady at the OK Corral, The True Story of Josephine Marcus Earp by Ann Kirshner. Love and Danger in the Old West by Glenn Davis. History.net, wikipedia.org. Kathy Weiser Alexander and the Legends of America website, legendsofamerica.com. The Drift and Ramble podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and just about anywhere else podcasts are found. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and now on Patreon.com, where you can find details on how to access exclusive content. For our Tumbleweed supporters, you'll get access to insider information, show news, and other info. And for our Posse members, $5 gets you all that, plus access to bonus content, like Bat Masterson's story about Doc Holliday. This is stuff you can't get anywhere else, and it's commercial free. You can get all the details at patreon.com slash drift and ramble. That's patreon.com slash drift and ramble. Thank you for your support. You're listening to the Drift and Ramble podcast, true stories and American legends. We'll be back after this message. In the bygone era of the American West, a good smoke was highly prized, but quality was hard to come by. These days, Hypervape continues the tradition of quality with quality vaporizers, batteries, and chargers. Sleek and discreet, Hypervape products offer the best in value. When trust and reliability are the things you value most, Hypervape is the right choice. Like the high-grade quality folks sought in the days of the Old West, Hypervape might be harder to find. But here's a little secret to help ease your search. Just point your browser to hyprvape.com and order direct. Sleek, discreet, and reliable. Hypervape.com I'd like to thank the Pottern family for welcoming our podcast into the family and for helping us reach new listeners. How does it work? Just search the Pottern family hashtag or follow us on Twitter and you'll be introduced to other family members with podcasts ranging from full cast audio dramas to comedy, movie reviews, full tilt sci-fi geekdom, and everything in between. Some of our personal favorite podcasts include The Unwritable Rant with Juliet Miranda, Audio Oblivious Productions, Winnebago Warrior, The Tale of John Wayneby, and if you're into NASCAR, Right Sides Only Radio is right up your alley. Families prepping for a trip to Disney theme parks will love the informative Mouse Scouts, a podcast dedicated to making the most of your time and money at Disney theme parks. And finally, Tattooed Bananas podcast is two best buds riffing on stuff. In episode six, the buds Phineas and Bill infiltrate our show as humorist Mark Twain and other characters from our story. We love our Pottern family, and we know you will too. And that reminds me to remind you to show some love to the shows you love. If you have a favorite podcast, 
be sure to leave them a review on iTunes or on Stitcher. Nothing makes a podcaster happier than knowing they're appreciated for all the work they do. We love getting feedback from our listeners, so let us hear from you. We feature a review or two in each episode, so please go to iTunes or Stitcher and let us know what you think. Today's review is from Paige Turner on Stitcher. Five stars. Making history fun again. This podcast brings the Old West to life in every episode. Even if you thought you knew about events in Western history, you'll learn a lot listening to this show. The way the info is presented is entertaining and engaging, and you'll find yourself wanting more and more. Once you listen, you'll be hooked. Coming up on the next Drift and Ramble podcast. In the foothills of the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas, in newly formed Crawford County, was born a man who would become a legend. A man whose storied career was so impressive, he may have been the inspiration for one of the Old West's first fictional superheroes, the Lone Ranger. The man was born into slavery, but grew to become a deputy U.S. Marshal. His reputation for a successful arrest record was so well known among outlaws that some chose to turn themselves in rather than face him in a gunfight or have him track their trail. Bass Reeves became one of the most respected names in law enforcement and a legend in the history of the Old West. Bass Reeves is featured on our next episode. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West. Thank you.